The views and opinions of this program are those of the host guests and callers. There is substantial risk of loss in trading futures and options, which you should carefully consider prior to trading. Today's episode of Market Talk is brought to you by Growmark FS. Keeping up with the latest in ag is a challenge, to say the least, but there are experts nearby ready to help. You'll find them at your local FS. You can trust them to bring you customized agronomic grain and energy solutions bored of the latest thinking. That's because FS specialists receive continuous training that keeps them current on the latest trends, practices, and technologies. So you'll get local expertise that's both exceptional and up-to-date. Visit FSSystem.com to learn how FS is bringing you what's next. Well, wrapping up the week on Friday, we saw strength once again in soybeans, soybean meal. The corn market was okay. Cattle futures had a strong day as well to wrap up the week. Really just general positive money flow across commodities. Here to run through the week of trade with us and discuss, we say hello to Dwayne Bussey of Bolt Marketing joining us here today. Dwayne, good to catch up with you again, buddy. I hope things are going well for you there in uh, Northeast South Dakota. Yeah, no, it's it's good. Like you say, we're moving a little snow every once in a while up here. It's ain't right <laughs> along the North Dakota South Dakota corridor. We keep getting pounded by snowfall, and it looks like a Sunday nights our our next chance again, I guess. But whatever, we've got equipment for it. We just do it. To, at least it's March now, Jesse. So I mean, it it, it is going to come to an end sometime here. I promise. <laughs> yeah, sometime it's going to come to an end, and and we just hope that that is good moisture that eventually melts into the ground, uh, just to help out with, you know, mm-hmm. trying to make up some of that deficit from droughts and whatnot across the across the plains. I think for folks who have snowpack, that's that's the hope, at least anyway, Dwayne. Right? Yeah. Well, and you know what it will do is it definitely is going to get the Missouri and the Mississippi River levels back up to where they need to be, which needed to be done. You know, I, I mm-hmm. can sit here and say I don't like snow, but uh, I like the export market, though, so I can't have both, I guess. <laughs> well, let's uh, let's talk a little bit about that export market and just everything in general. Uh, soybeans, meal, you know, we started the week and, and really the end of last week. A lot of technical damage done to those charts to round yeah. out the month of February. But then we flipped the calendar to March, new month, new money flow, and three days in a row to wrap up the week of a, a fairly positive soybean soybean meal trade Uh, what's your thoughts uh, there just to kind of start our discussion today yeah you kind of nailed it you know the end of end of february was pretty ugly for these markets right i think a lot of it jesse was that march option expiration um put options that were in the money were being exercised or you know they had to get out of their positions one of the two and that makes for some screwy markets and that's starting to happen that last week of February more often. The other thing that I'm learning is happening more and more is, you know, Brazil, as they harvest their crop, they actually use our board of trade to sell on. And you know how it is for us in December for corn, right? It seems like a lot of farmers selling. Well, there's a lot of South America farmers selling on our board now during the last couple of weeks of February. So I think that all kind of dove down to a lower market. Then the problem is all that option expiration in the farmer selling from Brazil push the market low enough, then the chart looked horrible. So then you had technical selling on top of it. So just kind of, well, and then we probably just went further than we should have been, Jesse. And I think that's why you're seeing what you just mentioned. The last three days have not been bad at all. Nice recovery. You know, you flip the calendar and nice recovery here. And so I mean, back above the trend line, what I want to see didn't quite get above that 20 day moving average and hold. We're right there at the end of the day today. So eh, good, good trade. Still looks like a strong bullish market. Well, and it's interesting you bring up the fact of just how global our market is, you know, how global our board is with, you know, Brazilian farmers selling on our board. I mean, that's that's yep. an interesting thing to think about here when you throw in all the the technicals and the funds and the and the macro points in these markets, et cetera. I think that's something that maybe folks don't, you know, generally think about that could, you know, lead to volatility one way or another, Dwayne. You're exactly right. You know, there's a there's a lot of trade that makes up these markets, right? And and you know, five years ago, Brazil wasn't that huge that there wasn't that much selling, and and there are farmers there are learning more about hedging and how to hedge, and yeah, they do it on our board, believe it or not. So, I, I think what I'm trying to say is get used to it. I think that last part of February, if they've got a big crop like they have this year, you're going to see f- basically farmers selling on the board, and it pushes it down. And like I said, that then. 
So that suddenly starts and then the chart pattern gets broken. So there's, <laughs> there's a lot to every day. We're not just making the stuff up all the time anyway. There's actually <laughs> something to it. <laughs> well, and, and looking at this soy complex as a whole here, obviously a good wrap up to the week, but just seeing the way the action was and how quickly we could come down, I think that's maybe a good reminder that these markets could slip out from underneath us at any time. So I'd have to think, yeah. you know, in soy, especially here, protecting some of that downside risk is going to be crucial the next couple of weeks, Dwayne. You're you're absolutely right. That's probably the good thing about, you know, even for a bull like myself, right? Everyone knows I've been kind of the bullish one hanging on to too much old crop supplies and not doing a lot of new crop hedging yet. And even though you and, I, you and I have talked about risk management and things you can do, we've been patiently waiting. So this pullback when it happens, the sell-off makes a guy kind of nervous and, and farmers in general too. And, and talking to a lot of farmers, it seems like they're that 20% hedged in this area on new crop. And that's, that's not much, right? If this market's going to tank. So the good thing about this pullback, you watch a lot of guys are going to be looking at the spreadsheets and maybe making a marketing plan going forward. And, you know, you always say the same thing, right? It gets back up there. I'm going to sell. And these pullbacks like this usually do actually help for me to make marketing plans for guys of like, yeah, you know, $14 beans is okay to sell. Uh, so make some marketing plans. When we get back up there, let's go ahead and sell some. And, you know, if you need to on these downturns, you know, you buy some courage calls above the market if you want. That way it gives you the courage to sell. Um, I'll keep rambling if you don't mind, Jesse. That one I liked this week was August short dated 650 courage calls for corn. Mm -hmm. Now, so that, yeah, it costs about 11 cents. And that's, I like to get them as cheap as possible, like everyone does right now. I'm not saying that that's going to make a person a ton of money, but if by owning that call up there, it gives you the courage to kill, sell if we get back above $6 on these corn, it, it kind of did its job for me. So you know, it's, it's all about emotions and controlling those emotions. If those courage calls are a tool that helps you control emotions so you can sell, well, by God, it's, it was a nice dip to buy those on. That's a great point. That's a great thought to consider there. Uh, looking at the activity in beans and corn, both on Friday, some of that spread trade between old and new crop. I wonder, is that an indication of some demand possibly coming into the market, Dwayne? I really think so. I, we haven't got that confirmation, right? We, we had the rumors earlier this week that China's in there buying uh, some corn and you know maybe some beans on the dip. And haven't really seen that daily sales announcement at eight o'clock, right? So we're in trades a little disappointed in that. However, boy, this trade action today sure acts like there was some export business done. I don't know who bought, but somebody did, you know, because we're leading in the front months, bull spreading, like you said. So you might not see a sales flash. Maybe it's next week's export sales. You see it, but there, there was some business done on the dip and for me being a bull, that's what I've always been saying is that, you know, our, our stocks are tight enough. We should see good support on dip. So I think we did here. We'll find out maybe next week. Well, we'll continue to watch and see what we get on that export front, like you said. And I, I know there's been some farmers selling out there uh, here mm -hmm. in the last couple of weeks. When you look at basis just across the countryside, think about some of that farmer selling. How do things look to you? What are your thoughts there? I think what we saw is massive farmer selling when the calendar flipped to this year, 2023, early January, the trucks were flying and, and the markets were good. Um, you know, programs like yourself and everyone else is like, you know, these are good prices. I mean, that's what all of us were talking about, right? Brokers. So I think the, the reason it waited till January was I think farmers wanted the sales in the next tax year, I think. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, they were fine sales. They would have sold in December if they could have, but they wanted it bumped back. So yeah, weather got better. I think there was a lot of green movement, a lot of corn, a lot of soybeans got sold. I think it started to dry up a little bit in February, but the basis pulled down a lot. The damage had been done. I mean, up here in my area, the basis is worse for soybeans than it was during harvest now. So yeah, gun to my head, uh, <laughs> don't do what I do. Don't follow me and still have your soybeans. Wonder <laughs> if that can come back. Here's the thing is central Illinois basis really picked up now for soybeans the last couple of days here. And that to me is a good sign and kind of a reminder of our old crop stocks are still very tight. Uh, I think basis will improve in the spring. You know, farmer selling is now going to dry up. So I think the basis does improve, but that'll be a location case by case deal. You know, if you had a big crop in your area last year, your basis won't improve as much as say my area where there was too much prevent plant last year. We just don't have the bushels here. So the basis will probably improve quite a bit. 
One other thought on corn and soybeans as well. I know this coming week, March World Agricultural Supply and Demand Estimates report. Any thoughts ahead of that? Do you anticipate we could see some some surprising numbers there with with the March report, Dwayne? Ahead of, I know we'll have yeah. you know acreage intentions at the end of the month. Uh, what's your yeah. thoughts with this WASD coming up? Yeah, uh, the, the WASD report coming up is probably slightly bearish for corn. You know that that export demand. Uh, I <laughs> sure I'm a bull, but boy, that, it just isn't showing up. And it was another poor week of sales this week. So. Probably we're going to see USDA lower export demand, 50, maybe even 75 million bushels. And that just gets added onto the end stock. So that old crop tight supply I keep <laughs> talking about is actually growing a little bit. So I'm losing my bullhorns there a little bit in the corn market. On soybeans, it might, well, I want to say it's going to be interesting because of the Argentina drought. And because that drought is really massive and it just keeps getting worse. I, I, I think we have a real problem there. I think that production is going to keep decreasing. But USDA likes to slow play that, Jesse. And that's fine. That's probably the right thing to do. So they're probably not going to drop it as much as the trade would like to see, or at least the bulls would like to see. So you might see them drop Argentina corn and soybean production some, but not as much as the bulls want. So generally quiet report, which you usually get in March, like you said, the, the big Fireworks will probably come the end of the month when you got the quarterly stocks report and that big planning acres intentions report. Well, we are having a conversation today with Dwayne Bussey of Bolt Marketing. And Dwayne, let's uh, talk a little bit about the wheat market. Fairly quiet end to the week uh, across wheat, Chicago, Casey, Minneapolis. I know these markets have, have had their damage done to the charts. We're back down, uh, you know, basically levels we saw before the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Uh, what's right. your thoughts with the wheat trade here as of late? I know there's some skepticism out there about the grain deal getting extended in Ukraine, uh, but right. still feels like that's not necessarily driving this market back to the upside. No, not not yet anyway. You're right. Uh, was it, I think, March 18th is when the current Black Sea grain export deal between Russia and Ukraine uh, ceases to exist or expires. For the most part, you know, a week ago, I would have told it, yeah, it's going to get extended. Russia needs it as much as Ukraine does, blah, blah, blah. There's starting to be just a little bit of question on it, isn't there, that maybe it doesn't get done. And when you stop and think about it, you know, what, what kind of season is Ukraine in right now? You know, they're like us, they're in, in their winter, their winter wheat's growing, they're starting to plant a little bit of the spring 23 crop over there. Now, there's not a big flow of grain right now. So if Russia was going to put the pinch on them and maybe China wants to put the pinch on them. Now would actually be the time to do it. So I, I don't know if it gets done or not, but it, I just thought of that the other day, like hey, it wouldn't be, they can do it, you know, for a month or six weeks and it really wouldn't affect global trade much. But what it would affect Jesse is these funds that are massively short this wheat market. You know, they're short, maybe a hundred thousand contracts. We're not sure without the come up in a traders report, but if you're short and we're down, like you said, the levels before pre-war, I don't think you want to be short anymore if they close the export market down there. So I got friendly the wheat market here this week thinking we should be at a bottom and could bounce on that Ukraine uh, export deal ceasing at the eh, 18th of March, I think I said. How much has the lack of that CFTC data and now we're trying to get caught up? How much has that influenced this market as a whole, do you think, Dwayne? I, I don't know how much it changed and moved the market, but it sure is frustrating as hell, if I can say that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, you know, that's, I like that report. Um, I learned quickly that the funds move this market. I can sit here and study and do research and talk to you till I'm blue in the face like I normally do because I don't shut up <laughs> about my ideas and where I think the market's going to go. But the funds are such big players. If they decide to exit a few contracts like they did the end of February, we crash point blank the you know so i'm very frustrated that we aren't up to date on that report and and honestly kind of questioning wh why we can't get caught up it's really the one report and the one technology that hasn't increased in the 20 plus years i've traded it's still the same report that comes out friday afternoon as of tuesday's night's close we act as if we're still looking at the post-it and the all the paper order tickets and have to shuffle them together i don't quite see how we can't get up to date um reports on that from the cftc but uh on the COT report, but uh, I don't know. Maybe you can answer that one for me later. 
I'll do some digging. I'll see if I can find an answer. I don't think I'm going to be able to find one either there. I don't think we're big enough to get the answers for that, but there's, there's something going on there and it frustrates me. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I think I am with you on that as well. Well, we'll continue to watch the volatility in grains and obviously be smart about your marketing decisions there. Let's move to yeah. livestock. Dwayne, this cattle market uh, waiting here on cash trade this week again, uh, had that standoff at feedlot country uh, really robust day live cattle feeder cattle which yeah. I, I found to be good maybe encouraging because it's felt to me the last couple of sessions that this cattle market's maybe getting a little tired up here at these high levels Dwayne. oh you're 100 percent right you know we don't have news every day to move these markets and, and we it's important to remember that so when a market runs up like say the april fat cattle board we get up to the 166 area. I think Feb went off, you know, 167 plus. I get it. it. You know, we get tired. Like you said, cash cattle only trade usually about once a week. And a lot of times it's Friday afternoon before the market's closed. So, you know, we pause. We correct the overbought condition, things like that. And yeah, going into yesterday's close, I was a little nervous about this cattle situation. We broke a, you know, the 20-day moving average, which I like to think is big support and so yeah, I looked a little tired. I like the word you use, but boy, a nice rally today. Turns out cash cattle is happening. Big surprise. That's probably why the market went up uh, as much as maybe $5 higher in the meat up here in the north. And look for that to continue, Jesse. There's going to be a premium for good, clean cattle. I shouldn't say good. They're all good cattle, but we've got some really muddy feedlots in Nebraska, like mm -hmm. horribly muddy. So horrible conditions. So they're just carrying a lot of extra weight you would say. And the packers will know that and see that. And the buyers will discount those cattle and they're going to pay a premium for the good, clean cattle. I shouldn't say good again. <laughs> they're all good. They're all good. They're all great. <laughs> but you're going to see those premiums for the North. So yeah, watch the cash cattle trade. When you see a price, ask where they came from, because that'll be a big difference moving forward this spring. I've heard some rumors of some trouble with early calving season in some parts of the North. Have you heard anything to that rumor, Dwayne? Actually, not much yet. Um, after last year's horrible spring, I, I, I'm learning to try to avoid cow calf guys a little bit, not ask them how it's going. But no, I'll have to check in on that and report back to you. You know, the guys up this far north that are starting to calf usually have facilities because it, it is pretty cold. You know, and, and we'll warm up quickly. When I had cattle, it was about March 7th or 8th is when we started. And it was always that last week of February, I was panicking, wondering what the heck I'm thinking because we had a snowstorm coming. It'll warm up and get better, but I'm not seeing that in the forecast, sadly. Very cold temp, so they're really going to have to watch at night for those little ones to be born. You don't want those frozen ears. We all know how they get docked. So mm -hmm. we'll watch it close and have to report back to you how spring calving goes. All right. Fair enough. Fair enough there. Hog market, uh, just kind of quiet, you know, to wrap up the week again, maybe got some spillover support from the cattle complex. Uh, you know, I look at lead month April now and compare it with that mm -hmm. cash index. I, that's what I was wanting to watch you the last couple of weeks and slowly converging together here. It's just taking yeah. quite a bit of time to wane. It is. It is. And, and I think the futures market is doing the right thing by trending lower to go meet the cash. I, we're going to have more hogs coming into uh, slaughter than usual for this time of year. So it's not going to be the other way where cash is going to come up to meet the futures. Futures are probably going to have to keep trending lower, but that hog market has been so wild, Jesse, you know, uh, commission brokers always like to trade, right? But this is a, this is a commodity that I'm like, well, maybe we just stay the hell away from it. It's uh, been a little crazy, a little volatile, but yeah, if I'm, if I'm having to pick a position, it's actually to be a bear on this hog market, sadly, because the cash index is lower than the futures, like you said. Well, Dwayne, uh, we always appreciate the time and insight here. Uh, before we wrap it up, I'll, uh, I'll leave the floor yours here. Any final thoughts you want to share? Anything else on your mind that uh, we need to think about here watching this market trade? Yeah, you know, back to the grain thing. Um, if you are like me and you're holding old crop and you've been bullish because you maybe missed out on some profit potential last couple of years, let this be a little bit of a wake up call. Um, you know, let's sit down and make some marketing plans because you're about to get busy. Believe it or not, it will get out there in the spring. And, and as much of a bull as I am, Jesse, I do think this is a year to be an aggressive seller on the spring rally because with higher interest rates and possibly a bigger crop, we'll find out, you know, these prices could be sharply lower by fall. So get your marketing plans done up this weekend, uh, watch some basketball and um, put them in place on Monday. <laughs> That's a good call. Good call. If folks need some advice, Dwayne, they want to reach out to you there at Bolt Marketing. What's the best way to do that? 
Yeah, if they got some questions on a marketing plan or what we're doing, they can call us here directly, 605-448-2365. And they can always check out our website at boltmarketingllc.com. Always great to catch up with you, buddy. Appreciate the time. Have a great one. And we'll talk to you again soon. Dwayne Bussey of Bolt Marketing, thanks so much for being on the show today. Thanks, Jesse. That's going to do it for Market Talk. Find us online, markettalkag.com. I'm Jesse Allen. Have a great afternoon.